Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and Matt Powell has an inflatable banana in his backyard which he calls Dr. Peel. I don't know why I just said that, it was very involuntary. Let me try that again. Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and Matt Powell has an inflatable banana in his backyard which he calls Dr. Peel. No, I just can't not say it. Anyway, recently Matt Powell posted a video called The Best Argument for Creation Science. I see that he's really putting Dr. Peel's brains to good use there. But if this is the best argument for creation science, then obviously they've got no better arguments for creation science, otherwise it wouldn't be the best argument for creation science, would it? So this better convince me, Matt. Natural selection itself cannot preserve a population. Natural selection is something that is required in order to drive evolution. Natural selection is something that is required, according to an evolutionist, to keep us alive as a population. So already he has made a mistake there. Natural selection does not keep populations alive. All it does is individuals that are very bad at surviving in a particular environment, well, they die off. And this means that individuals that are better suited to survive, well, they're more likely to have more offspring. So natural selection, whilst it may be one of the drivers of evolution, is not the thing that's keeping us alive. But the problem is that natural selection itself cannot stop mutations from getting added to populations over generations. What this means is that each generation, we actually have 100 to 200 more mutations than our parents had. Now these mutations are defined as neutral. However, it still is an alteration of existing information that is functional information. So firstly, not all of those mutations will be on functional information. Some of it will just be on DNA that is not even used. If you're a programmer, it's much like editing code that has been commented out so it's not used at all. And then there are also silent point mutations, and silent point mutations, they change the code in such a way that it does the exact same thing. And then there's also neutral amino acid substitution, which means that an amino acid has been changed, but that does not change the functionality of the protein. So those last two types of mutations do affect functional DNA, but the majority of mutations do not affect functional DNA. And you have to ask the question, what will happen if we continue having mutations that mix up and scramble information over these generations? All mutations must have some effect, even if that effect is vanishingly small. Okay, so amino acid substitutions, they may have some effect later on down the line, potentially. But silent point mutations and mutations that do not affect functional DNA, they have no effect whatsoever. This is because no proteins have been changed. Everything remains exactly the same as it was before. If you start randomly changing DNA sequences, and randomly changing functional information, it is going to, by definition, cause it to be dysfunctional. Well, no, because some mutations are beneficial and some mutations are neutral. It's only the negative mutations that are going to be bad for you. This is why evolution is false, and this is why creation science is true, because of the fundamental of science, because of the fundamental of what a mutation even is. Wait, are we just going to ignore natural selection now because Natural selection means that if you do have an individual that has a negative mutation, that individual is less likely to survive and reproduce. It seems like Matt Powell has a hard time wrapping his head around the idea that two different mechanisms can be operating at the same time. Mutations building up in populations over generations will cause the extinction of all populations over time that accrue those mutations. So it seems like he's forgotten the concept of alleles, which means that populations don't all have the same gene unless there has been a bottleneck recently. But when there is no bottleneck, populations tend to have quite a bit of variation in their genes. And this is because genetic information is only passed to your offspring. It isn't passed to the entirety of the population's next generation. So as long as there exists alleles which are suited to the environment, then the population is just going to continue to survive. This is why creation is true. It shows us that if we go back far enough in time, you would trace back to a single couple with the least amount of mutations, maybe even a perfect genetic code, and that it became imperfect when sin entered in and mutations have accrued since. Matt, so is what you're saying that God just invented mutations when sin entered the world? Is that what you're saying? He made the perfect creation, but because his creation decided, 
you know what, I'm gonna eat something fruity today. He got so mad that he decided to just ruin his perfect creation with mutations. Is that what we're going with today? Remember, we die from mutations. Yet mutations are supposedly the thing that drives a fish to a fisherman over millions of years, or even a frog to a prince. This is all nothing but fairy stories and fairy tales. So life evolving from common ancestors through millions of years of mutation, that's just a fairy tale to Matt. But a talking snake is perfectly fine. Humans being created from dust is perfectly fine. And a person being created from a rib is perfectly fine and not a fairy tale. Matt, when you show the process that allows people to be created from dirt and ribs, maybe then creationism will be taken a little bit more seriously. Mutations actually cause information to get worse. It is defined, a mutation itself is defined as an error. So according to evolution, by all these errors and all these mistakes, somehow we've become human. Somehow we have become better able to survive in this new environment. So for anyone that has done anything working with computers, you'll probably know that errors can produce some pretty interesting stuff. That is because errors aren't necessarily bad. Yeah, most of them are, but you'll get some good ones and you'll get a fair amount of ones that don't make any difference. One of the most important things to note is that natural selection may act upon a beneficial mutation, something that would help you survive in a different environment. But at no point in history, or in the present, or even in the future, will you see a group of beneficial mutations that will change an organism into a completely different type of organism, from a family to a different type of family. It just doesn't happen. So I've heard this sort of claim repeated quite a bit, so I have a question for Matt if he happens to be watching this video. And he might be, I don't know. And my question is, what mechanism would prevent something like a human over millions and millions of years becoming very, very different to the humans of today? Because you and I both agree that mutations happen. You and I both agree that beneficial mutations can happen. You and I both agree that beneficial mutations will be selected by natural selection. And if all three of those things are happening, then over time, beneficial mutations will accumulate. So what's stopping so many beneficial mutations from accumulating in a population that the population will look very different to the population that it came from? The reason that people believe that we actually descended from a common ancestor is because we share similar DNA with that of chimps and other creatures. Now, this is just proof of common design, not common descent. So we were designed with a lot of the same DNA that's not even used? Sounds like a very lazy designer if you ask me. Common design means that we are all on the same playground. We are all on the same planet. And so therefore, since we're all in one environment, it would make sense then that the creator would design us with similar strands of DNA. And sure enough, that is what we find. You know, if I were a god and I could do anything and I wanted people to believe in me, then I'd make all of my creations very unique. That way, they don't get confused by DNA looking all the same. But this does not mean that we all descended from a common ancestor and that mutations are what brought us up to where we are today. I don't know, when you talk about things like humans and chimpanzees sharing DNA that has been inserted by an ERV, that's pretty good evidence for evolution. Like why would God design humans and chimpanzees with ERV DNA in the exact same place? Like it gives evidence for evolution. So why would he do that if he wanted us to all believe in God? Like the only thing that makes sense that involves God here is if God decided to design life using evolution. Evolutionists will still claim that natural selection will somehow preserve us. But this is absolutely false, and here's why. Because natural selection itself can only select away a certain amount of mutations. It cannot select away all of the deleterious mutations that are getting added into these systems over these generations. What that means is that natural selection can only slow down the deleterious information getting added in, but cannot halt the deleterious information from getting added in to these generations. Matt, I hope you realize that because most errors in DNA don't do anything, that means that most errors in DNA are not deleterious at all. Now you might try and say, well, if you change the protein through amino acid substitution, then it gets changed again, that change again could be deleterious. And yes, 
But you know what's going to happen when it becomes deleterious? That's when natural selection kicks into gear. Natural selection will take care of harmful genes that appear. But just because genes are getting changed all the time doesn't make it more likely that harmful genes are going to appear. Now you might say, well, what about certain genes that are harmful, but only if you have two copies of the same gene? Isn't that an example of what Matt is talking about? So you may remember some funny squares from biology. They're called Punnett squares, and that's why they're so funny. So let's say that lowercase a is the recessive bad gene, and uppercase a is the dominant fine gene. Now, as you can see here, to get an offspring that has two bad genes in it, you have a one in four chance. So if this one here gets taken out via natural selection, then these other three will be the ones that survive. And as you can see, if we add up the genes from these three cases, the dominant gene is twice as prevalent as the recessive gene here. So yes, natural selection works even if you've got some sneakier genes. So this is why evolution is false. This is why creation science is fact and is true. And it is based on what we know. Not what we think we know, but what we know. If it's based on what you know, then publish a peer-reviewed paper on it. Publish a peer-reviewed paper that shows that you can get a person from a rib or dirt. You see, evolution is based on inference. It's based on, well, if changes over time can get added up, you'll change from a fish to a fisherman over generations. It's false. Well, actually, a lot of science is based on inference. If X and Y happens, then the natural conclusion of that should be Z. If Z turns out to be incorrect, well, then something's wrong with X or Y. Folks, this is why our side is so powerful. And this is why evolutionists and atheists they fail every time because their theory itself is based on fiction films rather than reality. Think about it. They think that we evolved from a sponge, like somebody off of SpongeBob SquarePants. So it seems like it's the creationist side that is pretty weak because if it was strong, then science would accept their ideas. But it doesn't. And then he goes on to say that atheists and evolutionists get their idea from fiction. No, we get it from the evidence. Sure, not every atheist and not every evolutionist will follow the evidence, but a decent portion of us will. But the thing is, Matt gets his ideas from fiction. You know, the Epic of Gilgamesh is a piece of fiction that Matt believes. So, I don't know, something about throwing houses in a glass rock, I guess. Now remember, the reason that things like cancer exist is because of mutations. The reason that autism exists is because of deleterious information, these mutations that are getting added into populations. Think about Down syndrome. Down syndrome was caused by a mutation, a group of mutations that got added to populations and caused deleterious information to get added that we were able to see with our eyes and verify. So let's go through each of those things. So the first one is cancer. And yes, cancer is a result of mutations. Now the thing is with cancer, if you get rid of the cancer, the rest of your body survives. Yes, cancer can come back, but that is more of a result of telomeres shortening over your lifetime. And the second thing he mentioned was autism, and I actually have to give him some props here because it's not every day that you see someone mention that autism is partially at least a result of genetics. So good on you, Matt. I award you with a thousand god points. I'm starting to run out, so don't ask for any more. So with autism, it's one of those things that isn't always bad. In fact, it can be quite helpful to some people. Yes, sometimes it can make it quite difficult to live if you have autism. But some people with autism do have advantages over neurotypical people. Like some people with autism do learn faster, at least at a young age. It's not necessarily a black and white thing where we can point at something and go, this is bad, because it can be bad, but it can be good. Now Down syndrome is caused by an extra chromosome. If you have Down syndrome, that doesn't mean that your parents had Down syndrome. But there are times when people get extra chromosomes and it causes no issues at all. So all kinds of things can happen, Matt. Not all of them bad. So this proves that we did not start off as goo. This proves that we did not start off as a rock. And yes, that is what evolution teaches, is that we all descended from rocks. The granite rock 
had chemical elements inside of it. And when it was raining for two million years, that those heavy chemical elements were eroded from the rocks and then we evolved from those heavy chemical elements. That is abiogenesis, not evolution, Matt. Abiogenesis and evolution are two different things. But the thing is, abiogenesis is at least a viable hypothesis, unlike dust creating people. To say that your ancestor was a rock while mocking the idea that we all descended from a single set of parents, that requires a great amount of primitive superstition. I have never in my life seen dust give birth to non-dust before. You believe that dust is your granddaddy. So when you see dust, you go, oh, hi, granddaddy. To make fun of the idea that it could rain for 40 days and 40 nights while believing yourself that it rained for 2 million years is a perfect example of the fallacy of false equivalence. Flinging your own poo onto the Christian. When you're not able to defend your position, you may fling your own problems onto Christians. I've seen it many times. Ironically, the term that you're looking for there is projection, and you just use the fallacy of false equivalence. So, uh, good on you, Matt. How did Matt use the fallacy of false equivalence? Well, he compared it raining for 40 days and 40 nights to raining for 2 million years. Except, the raining for 40 days and 40 nights isn't what people make fun of. It's the global flood that people make fun of, not the raining for 40 days and 40 nights. Rain for 2 million years is very different to a global flood because rain for 2 million years doesn't necessarily mean that the earth is going to flood. And besides, where I live, it's always raining, so you're not necessarily gonna get a flood if it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. And if you're an evolutionist, I would encourage you to watch my videos because they explain why evolution is not true. I wonder how that statement is going to age. We'll see, shall we? And to any critics out there who would challenge these ideas, remember I have debated many of them. I've debated PhDs on this matter of evolution and old earth creationism, and it is false. It sounds like you are suffering from Dunning-Kruger, Matt, which by the way is very different to Dunning-Kruger. Dunning-Kruger is what you get when you Dunning-Kruger, Dunning-Kruger. If most people that have studied a subject disagree with you about the subject that they have studied, then maybe you're wrong. Maybe you should try and get a PhD in evolutionary biology, Matt. Then you might actually understand the subject that you are trying to debunk. But anyway, leave a like and subscribe if you like this video. Leave a comment letting me know what you'd like me to make videos on in the future. I am starting to run out of ideas, so any ideas are appreciated. Or you could join my Discord server and give me ideas there. That is another option. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. Huge Jars, MC Nutkin, Shaky, Wolfie, Mori, Grey Mole Ghost, Kid Vicious, Sacha Campbell, and Militant Agnostic. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, Matt Powell has an inflatable banana in his backyard, which he calls Dr. Peel.